Welcome to this proof of concept video. Today I'd like to introduce you to a simple algorithm for computing a modular inverse modulo a prime. It'll sometimes work for a composite modulus too, a little bit more about that later. The method has presumably been rediscovered many times by mathematicians, and I've seen it attributed to Gauss. For myself, I rediscovered it while teaching cryptography and making these videos. The usual approach to computing a modular inverse involves the extended Euclidean algorithm. The Euclidean algorithm is sort of the mother of all algorithms in number theory, and rightly so. But the method I'll show you today is simpler and easier in some cases, particularly if you're working by hand. I'll assume you're comfortable with modular arithmetic. If not, I've got a video for that. Modular arithmetic comes with the operations of addition and multiplication, and by extension, subtraction. However, division is a trickier game. Consider the question, what is one half mod five? We can't really talk about a half, the familiar rational number, because in the modular world, we don't have anything between zero and one. What I mean is that mod 5, there are only five things, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So if this question is going to have an answer, it should be one of those five things. The answer to this conundrum is that we need to think of a half not as living halfway between 0 and 1 on the number line, but as that which when doubled is 1. Then we can ask what when doubled gives 1 mod 5. So this has an expression as an equation. 2x is congruent to 1 mod 5. Then the definition of the idea of a half is just that which solves this equation. Okay, so let's solve the equation. We're working mod 5, so we can solve it by just checking everything and seeing what works. So here are the multiples of 2. Oh look, there it is. 2 times 3 is 1 mod 5. Okay, so that does it. The proper notion of a half mod 5 is just 3. In fact, it actually is halfway between 0 and 1 on the clock. Take a look at that. Anyway, we have a special name for this. It's called the multiplicative inverse. So here's a definition. Let a be in z mod nz, that is the integers modulo n. Then if x satisfies a times x is 1, we say that x is the multiplicative inverse of a. Some things don't have a multiplicative inverse, like 2 mod 4. No amount of multiplying 2 by things will ever get you 1 mod 4, because we can't even ever get anything odd. Okay, so here are some basic facts about multiplicative inverses. The inverse of a exists if and only if a is co-prime to the modulus. And second, if the inverse exists, it's unique. Fact 2 is why it's okay for me to talk about the multiplicative inverse instead of a multiplicative inverse. You can find explanations for these facts in my other videos, um, so you can check the description below. The purpose of this video is to show you how to solve this equation, to find the multiplicative inverse when it exists. For this method, the modulus needs to be prime, or you might get in trouble. Actually, it'll often work anyway, but it gets snagged on some small divisors of the modulus. It's also possible to work around the obstacle, and I'll talk briefly about that at the end. It turns out that finding the multiplicative inverse is a very useful task you'll need to do in all kinds of circumstances. In particular, it'll let you solve linear equations mod n. Okay, so consider a prime modulus p. I'll call it p to remind you it's prime. Now consider an invertible element a in z mod pz. In fact, all non-zero elements are actually invertible. There's another video you can check out, multiplication in motion. So we're just assuming that a is non-zero. We want to find the multiplicative inverse of a mod p, meaning we want to solve a x is congruent to 1 mod p. The key idea here is to loosen the target. Instead of finding a multiple of a that's 1, that's exactly 1, we're going to find a multiple of a that's smaller than a. The notion of smaller is actually a bit suspicious in the modular world. So, I mean, for example, 2 million and 1 is a huge number, right? But it's actually very small mod 10. It comes out to 1. But I'll ignore all that, and I'll just take small to mean close to 0 on the clock. So how can I find a multiple that lands close to 0? Well, the multiples of a wrap gradually around the clock. Take a look at this example, mod 37, where a is 7. The multiples of 7 march around the clock and they miss 37. They have to, because 37 is a prime. It isn't a multiple of 7. But let's zoom in on how they miss 7, 37. 37 lies between the multiples 5 times 7, namely 35, and 6 times 7, namely 42. So we see two multiples of 7 right here, which are closer to 0 than 7 was itself. One is at a distance of 2, and the other at a distance of 5. 
The two endpoints give some corresponding arithmetic facts, which relate 37 to 5 times 7 and 6 times 7. Now, in general, when we wrap around the multiples of a, we get to approximately p over a multiples of a when we're near 0. Since a doesn't divide p, we only get close. We have to skip over 0. To find this, the, this exact multiple or these two multiples surrounding 0, we can call on the division algorithm, namely divide p by a, which means to write p as q times a plus r, where q is the quotient and r is the remainder. This is just the long division that you learned when you were in grade school. In particular, the remainder always lies between 0 and a. On the modular clock, this means um, what this means is that qa is near 0, and r is the little extra distance you have to go. The point is that r is smaller than a, and we found a multiple of a whose distance from 0 is small. Now, it might be, depending on how the multiples lie, that you actually want to think about the multiple just past 0 instead of just before it. So then we write p is q plus 1 times a minus a minus r, because q plus 1 times a is the next multiple, the one that's just past 0. Then the distance to 0 is a minus r, and just like in the first case, this distance is smaller than a. Okay, notice that the two distances add up to a, so at least one of them is smaller than half of a, so just store that little fact for later. Now the idea is that having found a multiple that's smaller, we start the process over again with that smaller number and just keep going until we hit 1. Let's watch it happen now for a modulus of 37. Suppose we want to find the inverse of 7 modulo 37. We can use the division algorithm to find that 37 is 5 times 7 plus 2 and 6 times 7 minus 5. So what have we learned in modular language? Well, we've learned that 5 times 7 is negative 2 modulo 37 and 6 times 7 is 5 modulo 37. Okay, I prefer positives to negatives for simplicity, so we can rearrange the first of these so that it's negative 5 times 7 is 2 mod 37. Okay, so we haven't found the inverse of 7, but we did find a multiple that gets us closer to 0, which is to say, namely, taking negative 5 sevens gives us 2. Okay, but what good is that? All right, well, here's the trick. What if I just happened to know that the inverse of 2 was 19? Then I could combine these two facts on the screen to get the inverse of 7, right? The inverse of 7 would be um, negative 5 times 19. If we multiply this out, we just get negative 95, which comes out to 16, modulo 37. So basically, I've replaced the problem of inverting 7 with the problem of inverting 2. All right, is that really any easier? Well, it's not actually obvious that it's any easier. But what if we keep replacing my inversion problem with the problem of inverting something smaller? What's closer to 0 than 2? If I keep making things smaller, eventually I'll get to 1 or minus 1. And that's definitely easier to invert, because the inverse of 1 is just 1. So let's go back to the example we were doing. We just found a multiple of 7 that was 2. So let's start the problem over again with multiples of 2. Here I find that 18 and 19 2s surround 0. So I get two facts. 37 is 18 times 2 plus 1, and 19 times 2 minus 1. I think the second of these is nicest, because it actually says that 19 times 2 is 1 mod 37. In other words, I've found a multiple of 2 that's smaller than 2, namely 1. But 1 is what we were hoping for. I've actually just found the inverse of 2. So now I go back and use this together with my expression for 2 as a multiple of 7 to find the inverse of 7. Okay, so there we go. That's the whole idea. Let's formalize this a little bit. We wish to find the inverse of a mod p. First, initialize a0 to be a. We keep track of how many times we do the main loop with a variable i, which begins at 0. a is the thing that's changing, 7 and 2 and so on in the example. Okay, so we're going to loop, and we'll keep looping a0, a1, a2, etc., until we find that ai comes out to 1. In the loop, first we write p as a multiple of ai plus a remainder, let's call it ri, this is just the division algorithm, and we'll actually write it in terms of the next highest multiple of ai also, so here the remainder looks like ai minus ri. Next in the loop, we choose our next a, so this is where 7 gets replaced with 2. So here it's ai plus 1, and it's chosen to be the smallest of the two remainders in the two ways of writing p above. 
So then we're going to record also, here I call it bi, the corresponding multiple of ai. Then I increment i and I just keep going. I finish the loop when ai equals 1. There's no need to keep going then. Then I'm in the final phase, where I can compute the inverse as a product of all the bi's considered modulo p. And there we have it. That's the modular inverse algorithm. So next we should convince ourselves that this works. The key idea there is sometimes called descent. It's the idea that we keep repeating something in a loop where we have some number that keeps getting strictly smaller. If these numbers are integers, this simply can't continue forever. But in the algorithm above, this can only stop if we get to ai equals 1. So we've got to reach 1. Why can it only stop if we get to ai equals 1? The reason is that if the modulus is prime, then each ai is co-prime to p. Okay. So if ai is greater than 1, then we divide by ai, and we can't get a remainder of 0. In fact, we get a smaller positive remainder. This is true even if we're in the second case where we use the other half of the interval for a remainder. So then our new ai is again co-prime to p. And if it's greater than 1, this means we're in a loop, and we can just continue. So we can only break this loop if we get ai equals 1. So that's what actually proves that the algorithm works. The next important point is how fast the algorithm works. We begin with some a0, which is some distance from 0. Then, to choose a1, we look at an interval around 0 that's of width a, and we pick the endpoint which is nearest 0. So that means we can always do at least as well as a distance of a over 2 from 0. So if we mark the halfway point to 0 from a0, a1 is somewhere past that. And then a2 is closer to 0 than the halfway point from a1 and similarly for a3, and so on. So this is great news. It means the algorithm is actually very fast. The size of a is decreasing by half at each time we run the loop. So the number of loops is no more than the log base 2 of a. The number of multiplications in the final phase is also equal to the number of loops. So this runtime, which is called linear for its linear dependence on the bit length of the input, is reminiscent of the runtime of the Euclidean algorithm. I think, however, for calculations by hand, this algorithm is pretty nice, because it's a little simpler to think about than the extended Euclidean algorithm. Okay, finally, a comment on the requirement that the modulus be prime. Let's go back a couple slides. So for this argument that the algorithm works, we need each successive a to be co-prime to the modulus. If n has some small factors, we might just run into the problem that the remainder, while being non-zero, shares a factor with the modulus, and then we would get stuck. So there are a few possible workarounds for this. One is to use the Chinese remainder theorem to find the inverse for each factor, so break up the modulus. The second workaround is to try doing the division algorithm, not for the modulus divided by a, but for a multiple of the modulus divided by a. So that would correspond to wrapping the multiples of a several times around the clock before looking how the interval surrounds zero. So that will eventually work, but it messes up the runtime analysis. Okay, I think that covers it for today. Enjoy finding modular inverses.